what excited you most about Apple as you were looking at disrupting a, a traditional business and going over into that company? What were some of the biggest opportunities that you saw? You know, the main reason that I um, decided to leave Burberry after it was a, a huge decision, but, but one of the main reasons was because I felt Apple was one of the greatest companies on the planet. And I thought through their retail stores, which were so huge that so many customers had come into, that there was absolutely an opportunity to not only take the experience to the next level, but to actually have a greater impact on the communities. You know, Steve's original vision was to enrich lives, and he told the teams to always do it through education. So our goal was really to put programs together that could help 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 reskill the current generation and you know and, and help the next generation you learn a lot of the liberal arts skills that that uh, I think Steve always envisioned that they would need it and his products could provide as you reflect back on your tenure there at Apple what do you consider some of your major successes just as I was saying I think that you know we were able to redesign the stores um, and there are incredible flagships in the pipeline for the next four years but they're not just they're not even stores we called them town squares or gathering places because the entire community was welcome and and we partnered very closely with cities so that we could put those um, those stores if you will in areas that would also help that part help the city um, you know, and be it from Chicago to to L.A., et cetera. Um, so that was one. But I think the other thing is we were just talking about was the in-store experience that we called today at Apple and the fact that we were able to completely redefine and, and redraft some of the roles and, and create new positions for the teams and create a whole new zone in the store where they could now educate, um, come up with all of the Today at Apple programs, and, and the teams today, over 3,500 creatives around the world, are teaching 18,000 sessions a week so that, that they can help um, create the next Apple Music um, you know, kids, create the next app, iOS app developers, um, help kids be better photographers, better film editors, because again, it, in the future, leaning into the liberal arts is really um, we, we felt how the next generation is going to earn a living. So all of those free programs were just absolutely huge and, and very purpose driven for the community. You certainly have some major successes and we always have to ask sort of what do you wish could have gone better? What do you wish you could have redone or, or changed during your time there? You know, funny, I've said this everywhere that I've been. I mean, I don't, I never focus on problems because it was my job to fix them, right? And, it, and, so, and so I can never say that I wish I would have done something else. Um, I always say to myself that I never move fast enough. I mean, I don't think in this day and age, I think technology is just moving everything at such an accelerated rate. So um, we did a lot in five years, but I always challenge myself to move faster and, and, and do more. Well, there were some comments um, about some of the changes in the retail store, maybe customer satisfaction or employees there maybe not being as technical as they once were. How do you respond to some of those criticisms about the changes in those physical stores? Yeah, you know, I don't read any of it, and none of it is based on fact. It's everybody trying to find stories, et cetera. You know, when I left, retention rates were at an all-time high, up, you know, up over 20 points in the five years, and MPS scores were at historic highs, and, you know, so, so again, I know the facts, and, and so I, there were, there's a lot of things that are written. You know, I didn't give any stories to anyone because it was, you know, just not how I am. And it's, it's kind of the same thing here today. I'm here for the C2 conference because I love what they're doing. I love that they're helping, you know, inspire large companies, small companies on the importance of innovation and creativity and how you balance that with commercial so that you can have very purpose-driven businesses that make an impact in the future. So that's what I did at Burberry. That's what I did at Apple. And that's why I agreed to come to C2 today to, uh, to kind of share my thoughts with, with a wider group. Well, and when you share your thoughts about C2 and Apple and Burberry, one of the things that you mentioned that was really interesting is it's hard to just move fast enough. As the CEO and leading up major retail operations at some of these brands, what are some of the challenges of being the top leading executive? Is it just part of these big companies can't move fast enough? What would you say are some of the uh, major challenges and learning lessons about being a top executive? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think absolutely moving fast enough, but I think that, uh, and I think there's, there's a pretty big chasm between 
you know, my age, you know, as an executive and, and, and my teens, if you will. And, you know, I'm probably not alone in often calling my kids and saying, how do I do this or how do I do this, right? They're digital natives and they see the world differently. What's important to them is very different. So, um, you know, I, I think that, I think often executives reach a level where, you know, they think they should know and, and, and then they surround themselves with, with similar people. And, and I think that it's, I think it's so important to bring in the next generation because they have very different ideas. They see the world very differently. And, and, I, and I, I don't think that it's, I, you know, and, and we tried to do this at Burberry, we tried to do this at Apple. I mean, it, it is not a top-down exercise running a business anymore. I'm not in this social age at all. And we won, ran one of the largest crowdsourcing exercises at Apple my, the first year I was there and literally asked 60,000 employees around the world what they felt Apple should be doing more of in their communities. They helped inform the experience that now today is today at Apple. Angela, so much of our focus here at Bloomberg has always been on the critical numbers, right? Sales, profit and losses, that's really all it comes down to. We generally mm -hmm. have been spoken about a broader slowdown, not only in iPhone sales, but really in the mobile phone market uh, as you're sort of reaching a peak in some of the saturation of the mobile phone market, people maybe not replacing phones as quickly or as fast enough as they were in previous generations. From your perspective, from the retail experience, how how did you work on managing, you know, the revenue coming from the iPhone sales, but also working on selling some of the other brands, the other products uh, that maybe were not the core iPhone sales that really the, the core of the company, but also some other products as well? Yeah, so, you know, I don't... Um you know, I don't know if you know Steve's original vision for retail, and if you listen to Tim at the keynote last September, or, or the one prior that I did, he would stand up and say that, you know, Apple retail has always been about so much more than just selling. And, you know, they play a huge, huge, um, they do a disproportionate amount of the service on all of those products. With today at Apple, they do a tremendous amount of education. So over half of the staff is not there to sell. And, and Steve's original vision was they weren't allowed to sell anyway. None of them are on commission. Their job was to enrich customers' lives and, and through the lens of education, you know, on the products, on what they could do with them, et cetera. So that was our mission. That was our purpose. Um, there's a lot of things about phone that I had absolutely zero control over, et cetera. I will tell you that the retail stores are the world of. They, they, they over-index on almost all products, but there's a very wide distribution on phone. So they are one of the smallest in phone, but they're the largest in Mac and watch and AirPods and all the other product categories, you know, at least when I left. And that's the purpose of the retail stores. It, it's so beyond just, just a phone, though they do a magnificent job at that. So. It's so, so fun uh, you know, when you... Your question's a little less relevant for, for what my prior role was. Well, when we talk about the retail stores, I think your insight is very helpful. When we talk about some of the things maybe behind the scenes that were talked about, about changes within the actual physical retail store, what things maybe were discussed or talked about or changes that you guys were thinking of that maybe weren't necessarily enacted? What were those conversations like? I mean, honestly, there weren't any. We had a very simple five-year plan, and that was, you know, and, and those are all the big stores in the pipeline, again, that we showcased at the keynote, and we talked about how we would work with the local governments, and, and we would put these stores in places that would help, help the cities, et cetera. So there's a, a lot of those in the pipeline that, again, we shared at the keynote. There's flagships opening every quarter for the next three to four years, and, and we talked about the in-store. So, so that was, so there was the, the new flagship strategy. There was the new store design. Um, that that focused again on those passions, specific things for photography, specific things for music, et cetera, things that, that helped make your device even better for you if that was your passion. And the Today at Apple experience then that helped you go deeper with those passions, et cetera. So I'm not gonna tell you, you know, it's a very big business and everybody there was running a very big business. And, and I said with my five years that mission accomplished. We had a five-year plan. We executed to that five-year plan. And there is a tremendous amount in the pipeline that will only continue to make the impact in communities that we wanted to make. So I'm not going to tell you there, if, there if, I, if there was something that I couldn't do that I wanted to do, then I probably wasn't a good executive. 
Well, I think that you hit it on the head when you really highlighted the flagship and the ecosystem that is Apple. And I think every time you walk into a store, you feel that. You feel the Apple ecosystem in the presence. Uh, we're there, though, even though Apple feels to be the leader. Any other competitors that you look to or even in your experience as well at Burberry, sort of other stores that you were looking at or stores perhaps that maybe even learned from Apple as you think about even the basics of design and layout and really enhancing that customer experience experience in store? Honestly, no. You know, you get so many, you travel the world and you could get input from the tiniest specialty store in Montreal or, you know, or, or a, a magnificent airport store somewhere. So there is not one. You know, I think when you're as old as I am, you're taking, you're taking in hundreds of inputs every day. And of course that informs you know, where the design and where different things are going. But in our case, we had a great partner in Sir Johnny Ive. We had a great architect firm, Foster and Partners, that we worked with in London. And, and there were a lot of inputs from a lot of people that created what is now the new store design.